having uh, delved into retention strategies, let's now look at how technology can enhance both acquisition and retention. Um, and it's our final panel of the day. MarTech, why is it always acquisition versus retention? How a seamlessly integrated Mar MarTech stack can solve for both simu simultaneously. That is the hard word to say in English. Um, moderating this panel is Sam Talbot, Chief Product Officer at LiveScore Group. The stage is yours, Sam and your panelists. Welcome. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just introduce you, Sam. Yep. Hey, everyone. Martex, I was the last panel before drinks every year, <laughs> which is great. But yeah, decent turnout, so it's good. Um, we'll do a very quick rundown on introductions, uh, and then we'll get started. Do you want to crack on? Yep, thank you, Sam. So I'm Jean. Um, I'm head of marketing platforms at Betsing Group. I've been in iGaming for the last almost six years. Um, so what me and my team do is we um, we build, we maintain, we research and onboard marketing platforms, uh, marketing technology, to uh, optimize and scale acquisition efforts at Betsing Group. Perfect. Pleasure to be here. So Stephen Murphy, I am from Twilio Segment, so coming at this from a, a technology perspective. Um, so essentially, we're a customer data platform, um, so we make everyone's data dreams come true, essentially. <laughs> um, solving the data problem, unifying and building a single view of the customer, and then unlocking a, a number of these exciting use cases like retention, acquisition, uh, for a whole host of different sectors and companies, including LiveScore, uh, Entain Group, and others in this space as well. Um, so excited to speak with you today. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Adam. Uh, I've been in the industry now for 12 years almost, working at Betfair, Paddy Power, LiveScore, uh, Odds Checker as well. Um, most of the roles I had uh, were in marketing uh, tech. Um, so I've been working on integrations of tools like Segment, CDPs, um, CRM tools as well, um, analytics tools. Um, happy to be here. Hey, everyone. Uh, Nikki, I work with Common Group. I'm head of programmatic and display media. I've uh, been in the industry for just over eight years. Um, worked with ad tech a lot in the past. I was with Betson Group. Um, and now, yes, running the programmatic uh, online advertising team with Common. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I guess before, before we get into the tech itself, uh, it would be good to maybe start the conversation around, around the why. Um, so there's been loads of conversations already about acquisition, retention, how we, how we kind of achieve both from a strategic point of view. Um, I'd like to maybe start with thinking about it slightly differently and uh, how, we, how we kind of build strategies that, that accommodate both um, so we separate the silos. Sean, I wonder if you could start maybe by taking us through your thoughts on that. Yeah so, um, yeah, so I think it's, um, like you're saying, Sam, it's good to understand why we, um, we are embarking on this journey, why this is interesting. So um, traditionally, we've always looked at acquisition and retention separately. And um, like from an internal point of view, from a company point of view, it makes sense because they are different disciplines and um, they typically have their own teams and their own, uh, their own structures. But from a customer point of view, as I see it, there is no really acquisition and retention. Um, what customers want more and more from brands is to have um, a unified experience, a consistent experience, uh, to be served relevant and timely content, and whenever possible, even personalized. So perhaps if we can combine acquisition and retention and focus on the user journey as a whole, um, we can build an integrated system with a, with a strong underlying data um, foundation that allows us to understand more and more about our customers, can understand um, as much as we can, um, also be able to better track where our customers are on the user journey, and be able to serve that content um, which is better, re more relevant and more timely um, to them. And there are lots of use cases, and there are lots of um, evidence that shows that this could really help uh, from an acquisition point of view. It could help conversions quite a lot and uh, lower acquisition costs. 
And from a retention point of view, it can increase brand loyalty and improve the customer, uh, customer lifetime value. Mm. I think it's, it's interesting. We kind of go down the route of separating channels into the buckets. So you'll have like certain digital channels that are probably more swayed towards acquisition, email push obviously more swayed <laughs> towards CRM, retention. So maybe Nikki, you could talk to us about Obviously, your background in display and programmatic. How much of a shift have you seen um, from a digital spend point of view uh, from acquisition into a more kind of overall holistic strategy covering both? Um, well, programmatic specifically, just because of the tech it's founded on, can pretty much touch all aspects of the funnel. Um, it's important to remember that it's not just online display ads, right? So we, we can do connected TV, we can do in-game advertising, traditional video. Um, and because of the tech it's founded on, um, we can retarget people, of course, so hit people with personalized ads. Um, and I'd say at the moment, especially within this industry, it is regarded as mainly an acquisition driver, but um, I don't think that's probably its weakest point. It's important to remember also that it's very much an assisting channel, right? So if you compare it to PPC or affiliation or SEO, um, and if you're looking at measuring performance using a last touch model, a lot of the time we're not going to get the credit for the conversion. But if you had to look at it for retention, because um, it's all based on cookies, right? So if someone visits our site um, and they register and deposit and play, we can then uh, hit them with ads that are personalized based on their activities or their favorite games. Um, and I have seen companies more and more um, shift towards retention now. The important thing to remember is that with programmatic, the more specific you get in terms of targeting, the more expensive it becomes to run the campaigns um, and to hit these people with ads. So you always have to try to find that sweet spot for your return on investment, really. Mm. OK, great. And I think um, kind of taking a step back then into the overall stack and how we kind of build uh, the most efficient, scalable, sustainable MarTech ecosystem, and Adam, probably come to you first on this one. Yeah. Um, how do you see, so for example, at LiveScore, we have a commercial team who are looking to monetize our media product, uh, and there's a whole suite of tools that they want to use to be able to do that more effectively. Then we have a acquisition team that are looking at driving users from media into our betting products. And again, they have a whole suite of tools and systems that they're trying to use to achieve that. Uh, and then we have a CRM team who are basically trying to do the same thing, but from a retention point of view. And uh, you know, in a world where we're growing very quickly and it's very difficult, as we kind of touched on in previous panels, to, to maintain that level of kind of cross-functional uh, ways of working, it's very easy from a MarTech point of view to end up with a lot of different tools essentially doing the same thing. Um, so Adam, how do, you, how do you think we can solve that problem um, and achieve this kind of high-level, holistic approach to our MarTech ecosystem? I think it comes down to the organization. And as you sort of touched on there, there's, especially in large organizations, you have a lot of different teams that interface with different um, like partners, suppliers. Um, and that can lead to ending up with a lot of different solutions in a business that are overlapping in terms of what they offer. Um, so I think it starts with ensuring that you've got some sort of like uh, forum where you have people that are working with tools that are quite similar, um, discussing their use cases and discussing the conversations that they are having or thinking about having with partners. Um, in that way, you can sort of head off any sort of overlap you might have with um, different sort of areas of the business coming in and bringing in different solutions. Um, once you've got that forum together uh, and you've aligned the use cases, I think it's it's always worth having a look at the tools you already have deals with that you've had around in the business for a while um, and speaking to them about the um, capabilities because those solutions move on. So you might have had uh, CDP in the business for three years. You integrated them three years ago. Um, since then, they have moved on, but it's critical that as a business who works with that CDP or with any sort of system of that nature, you're speaking to them enough, running your use cases past them enough to understand if there are other, other elements of the tool that you could be using. Um, so that helps you 
essentially ensure, A, that you're getting the most out of the deals you've already got, and B, that you don't end up looking for a solution outside of the ones you already have to solve a use case you might have. Um, and then the final, I suppose, uh, thing that is handy to do is to get all of those partners together in a room. When you have a list of use cases, um, it's always worthwhile having your partners discuss those use cases both with you but also with each other because if you get to that stage where you're sort of organized, you've got your use cases, you're not overlapping with tools, then you often get good solutions out of getting your partners to work together. I guess, Stephen, this is probably where we bring you in from a, from a partner side. Sure. Um, like how, do you, how do you find getting involved with, with clients and being able to, I guess, sell your capabilities in the context of that holistic approach to, to Marsec and not getting too focused on one specific area? Yeah, yeah, really good question. So part of my role is sort of the art of storytelling, um, but it's crucial as well to keep it under the lens sort of cross-functionally. Um, so as a customer data platform, you can look at it from a data engineering perspective, uh, bringing in trillions of events essentially every month in a real-time basis. Then you've got the data governance um, teams, data quality teams as well from a consent perspective. Uh, then you've got it under the lens of marketing, of course, so the, the win-back strategies, uh, the fine-grained customer journeys and segmentation. Then we've got BI teams, then we've got data science teams, the proliferation of AI, machine learning as well, which is only as good as the data that you can pass into it. Um, so it's all about storytelling, but in a, in a cross-functional capacity, uh, as the CDP should enable data for all teams. Um, so that's part of my role. Um, and the other key aspect as well is getting buy-in from key stakeholders across the business as well, such as chief product officers, uh, chief financial officers um, in this day and age with the tough economic climate. Um, so in addition to storytelling from a capability perspective, it's about driving tangible return on investment, um, looking at metrics like net present value and, and how businesses can, can really generate value from the platform. So we see great stories with Live Scores Convergence and their strategy. Uh, Adavinta and other sectors, they're, they're saving 200% on their uh, campaign costs, for example, by leveraging a customer data platform, uh, saving 25% on data engineering effort. Um, so there's huge tangible metrics that can be driven, and that's, that's key to articulate from a cross-functional perspective as well. Mm. And how, how do you find, I guess this is open to the floor, but MarTech, generally speaking, um, is essentially acronym BINGO. Yeah. Uh, with you know DSP, SSP, CDP, whatever. Um, yeah. How how do we educate the rest of the business into understanding the capabilities that we are talking about? Because to me, it seems like uh, part of the problem is that the decision makers or the the, the contracts are signed a lot uh, before the right people have been involved and the most kind of holistic solutions have been scoped. So how do we go about better educating everyone in the business around the capabilities that we're talking about here? Um, yeah, I think for something like a CDP specifically, since it touches on so many different areas of marketing, if you're going to make the decision to try and adopt something like that, um, it might be worth trying to isolate specific use cases with specific channels and trying to get them to buy in and then rolling out the rest as time goes on rather than trying to involve everyone. Uh, from the get-go, and this is probably from personal experience, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've experienced this, right? Um, but I guess from an education standpoint, it's just about building those use cases to show people what you can achieve with it, really. Mm. Definitely. I think you have to, uh, like, what I find to really work well is to be very proactive with the teams, but also connected to things that they are interested in, because the thing is, um, when you talk about data, not a lot of people are always interested. So I think it's very important to connect what the data can do for them and what marketing technology can do for them, um, and really connect it to their problems and what they're trying to improve on, what they're trying to solve, um, and involve them as much as possible. Yeah, mm. yeah I know Adam and I, we've obviously uh, worked together in the past. Um, I've just noticed your, 
you're doing yourself a disservice. You're not having your new consultancy up on the <laughs> screen. Um, but Adam's now left LiveScore to uh, open up his own consultancy. But when we were together, we, we, we kind of went through both experiences, <clears> trying to <throat> deliver this big piece of, of work and then breaking it out into smaller use cases. And it'd be good to get your kind of opinion on the different strategies and, and actually the value that's delivered through these kind of smaller use cases, incremental delivery. Yeah, I think if you go for the the other way around, you know, you've got uh, you've got ideas and you want to bring a big solution in, and you don't break it down into smaller things, then it it you have to sell that to the teams that will do the integration. Um, and by breaking it into smaller pieces that are achievable more frequently, I think you bring the business along with you. It's easier to get to that sort of look, this is why we wanted to bring it in, here are the results of that first test, and now we can roll on to the second one. You can keep the buy-in of the people that need to do the technical integrations and the finance people as well who need to pay the bill. Um, I think if you don't break it down and you say we're going to go from zero to 100 before we do any sort of use cases in between, um, then it's easy to lose sight of you know, the things you could be doing that are easier than the harder things. Um, and in that way, I think the business will start to lose faith in that initial proposal you had, you know, to um, beat the whole world with a new CDP, uh, but it takes a year and a half to get it up and running, and everyone's like, where are these results that you said we'd be getting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think definitely if you can break it down, but also to touch on the earlier point, it's ensuring that, you know, if you have use cases in your team and you list them out and you go and find the right sort of uh, solution for it. More often than not, nowadays, solutions offer a wide range of different things. So if you take CDPs, um, there's a lot of different things you can be doing with that. You might have some use cases around acquisition, uh, but you should probably, as part of the process of building those use cases, in order to break them down, speak to other areas of the business as well and find out if they have use cases that can be solved, because that adds to the business case, but it also brings up more of these opportunities that are smaller and easier to go after to sort of prove the value of a decision like that. Mm. Yeah. No, definitely. I think, I think John, maybe it would be good to hear from you on, on how we've kind of brought that to life from your side uh, at Betson um, across all the different teams yeah, from a use case point of view. Um, just to add also what, what Adam is saying, um, um, I think apart from the use cases for marketing, I think it's also very good even to get the buy-in from the company um, uh, to uh, see the advantages that are also beyond just marketing. For example, uh, with a CDP, breaking down data silos makes it much easier for things like security, compliance, you know, um, the much coveted single version of truth. So, <laughs> um, so a lot of that actually does help a lot. Um, yeah, with, uh, with putting it all together, um, uh, as Nikki was mentioning, it's very important to work with the individual teams, with the different marketing teams, um, with CRM, even with product since there might be opportunities from a product point of view, such as personalization of content. Um, what I found to be really helpful is to, uh, again, take, try to take specific examples of what could be done. Something I found, especially in the early days, is that a lot this, the subject is a little bit vague to a lot of people. Like if you talk about connecting acquisition and retention or things like a CDP and what can you do with them, you know, like, unless you try to kickstart that thinking process with some tangible examples, even if they're not your own use cases, maybe just find other use cases that work for other companies, but just to kick off that idea, uh, that ideation process, um, it really, really works a lot. Um, yeah, and I think it's also very important to, um, to build like a committee, a driving committee. Um, I think there are certain elements in the company that really need to be involved very early on, um, such as, for example, data, analytics, product even, um, and start with that, and then start communicating more widely uh, when things are making more and more sense. Mm. And, and Stephen, from your point of view, how often do you go back into a client and explain or are or, or part of that um, closing the loop, let's say, uh, to, to explain the uplift or benefit or long-term value. You know, we talk about acquisition versus retention. Ultimately, <clears throat> we're talking about optimizing every single step of that customer journey from prospect all the way through to high-value regular user. 
Um, how, how much do you get involved in that, in that kind of shouting about success or learning from failures? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a key part of the role as well, not just a sort of pre-sales capacity and landing a new customer, uh, but actually understanding adoption um, of the technology across all the different teams, making sure that we're still aligned to the initial business goals that we, we sold to. Um, so that's, that's definitely a crucial part of the role. Um, and the, the separation of acquisition and retention is almost like this false dichotomy in a sense, in that once you've solved the data problems, so you've collected all of your mobile data, web data, cloud data, you're unifying that data into a, a single view of the customer, uh, you've got a broad understanding of the customer, um, essentially then you've got a rich data set from which you can go ahead and personalize the customer experience in a fine-grained fashion, uh, whether it's a win-back strategy, loyalty programs, customer service, connecting into the, I think, 10,000 different marketing tools out there for activation. Um, it essentially becomes this joined-up strategy, and it's, it's almost in the same breath. It's no longer a siloed discussion. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a huge element of the role just to make sure that the actual usage of the platform isn't kept in a silo as well. It's not just data engineering that's using the platform, but non-technical users can consume and self-serve on that data set, build out those journeys which, which look great, um, build SMS campaigns, email campaigns, um, and start to drive the metrics and values that we, we pitched as part of pre-sales. Um, so that's really important, particularly in a, a subscription business, uh, as that's where the repeat revenue comes from um, on predominantly our uh, the majority of our customer base globally. So we can't really talk about integrated MarTech stack without talking about risks and the future of data. Um, Nicky, I wonder if we maybe start with you from a display and programmatic side. It's probably a very pertinent topic. Yeah. Are we going to mention cookies? Mm, yeah. Possibly. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, this has been put off for a number of years, right? But it's going to happen eventually. Um, it's already happened in, in Safari and in Firefox. Cookies aren't supported. Obviously, as I mentioned, they are what display um, and programmatic are based on. So um, something like a CDP and really owning your first party data and connecting it to all your activation channels is going to be more important than ever. Um, so when we say first party data, we're talking about email addresses, anything that you can use to identify people uh, across the web outside of your own websites, right? So strategies, first party data strategies like um, for iGaming specifically, free to play websites, score predictors, anything you can do to start to build your first party data set outside of your actual website um, will help you be able to target people with advertising in the future. Yeah. But yeah, no, no one's looking forward to third party cookies going away, but it's going to no. happen. And then from, from a supplier side, like how much of that like from your point of view, Stephen, is, is built into your future planning and your sort of pitch to, to clients based on that fact? Yeah, so it's very much in terms of future-proofing your strategy, um, a customer data platform is in a, in a good place because it collects first-party data predominantly. Um, we very much complement the third-party data world as well by feeding a DMP, another acronym there. So, um, <laughs> So we can feed these other platforms and we can coexist very happily. Um, but when the third party cookie phases out, um, according to Google's strategy predominantly in, in Chrome, um, you very much need to pivot and make sure you've got something in place from a first party data perspective, uh, but also starting to track data server side as well as a trend that we're seeing. Um, so with our strategic partners like Facebook and Google, they're bringing out conversion APIs uh, sort of server-side tracking pixels as well. Um, so having that hybrid sort of client-side tracking and server-side tracking um, sort of methodology and, and strategy is, is key for, for the next decade, I'd say, as well. Yeah. And from like a product and platform point of view, I guess, more, more Adam and, and John, like what, what's your advice, I guess, on how we get, again, the right people thinking about this with enough lead time in order to actually mitigate the risks ahead? I think you have to, if you're the person in the organization that is responsible for the sort of like tooling, the data, um, it's almost your responsibility to make sure that people who care about business results know enough about what's going to happen to understand, understand it before it does happen because it will affect 
results. It will require you to think about your strategy from a, just an, like an overall marketing perspective differently. Um, and it will probably mean that you need to think about what your stack is and whether you've got the right sort of uh, tools to navigate a situation where you might be like heavily reliant on your DMP, uh, um, you know, and an acquisition through cookie-based activity. Uh, you need to get out ahead of that, plan what the new world will look like in a world where that will be less effective. I think lots of the organization has a buy-in to that, um, but they won't necessarily understand what is going to happen unless someone who is responsible for that stack and putting it all together is there sort of educating them as to what that actually means for the running of the business as it is now. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important sometimes to be comfortable with bearing bad news, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and making sure that uh, the right people understand it, you know, and uh, sometimes you might need to keep hammering a little bit until, uh, until they get it, but uh, that's why I also mentioned it's important to be proactive, because sometimes it might be a little bit too late, especially in bigger companies where things take time, you know, so, yeah. Do you think we've done enough as an industry to connect with our customers to the extent that actually that's the risk mitigation. Like for me, we're, we're so quick to try and figure out what's next. Like we, we, cookies get blocked, we figure out how to do cookie list tracking. Cookie list tracking will get blocked, we'll figure out how to do something else. Rather than actually understanding why we've gotten ourselves into this position in the first place. Yeah. Um, th it'd be good to get thoughts on, on where we think we are there. Um, I have quite a gripe with the direction the industry is going in, to be honest, because to me, personalized advertising should not be an annoyance, right, for the customer. But yes, we have found ourselves in this situation now. Um, and I, too, find myself annoyed by online ads most of the time. Um, I'm not going to lie. So, um, yeah, obviously, the large tech companies are keeping customer privacy at mind. Um, and on the previous note, I think the industry is getting turned on its head, right, especially programmatic but it's going to present a massive opportunity for those that stay ahead of the curve mm. to, to snatch up uh, as much market share in the small window before everyone else catches up that they can. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a sort of, like you said, we, an issue like cookie, cookies being removed comes up and we try and work around it all of the time, but actually we're not really answering the question as to why that's happening, like you said. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there are people in the audience or, you know, there are people that, were, that sort of understand the benefit or appreciate a personalized experience, even if that's off-site. And I think that requires businesses to think about how they can interface with those customers such that the cookie isn't the way that that information is collected. Um, Free-to-play games is a good entry point, but I think just being more open with customers uh, changes the conversation a bit. It's not about, you know, how do we track people that don't want to be um, tracked. It's about how we track people that do want to be tracked and we use that sort of trust knowingly and in a good way so that we can build it back up because that's where we are, where we are. It's not just our industry. It's all in, it's, it's just like it's cookies everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. but, um, trust is gone, so it's blocked. But I think you could build that back up uh, with the right journeys customers can go on and the right questions and the right sort of touch points and then the right usage of that. Like if you ask a customer if they want to have a personalized experience and they say yes, but then you get it completely wrong, either by not personalizing it or by personalizing it uh, in the wrong way, then you've lost trust, right? So yeah. I think that is a different way to look at the issue, really. I think for me, like, uh, I know time's running out, but I've, uh, I'm going to go on a little rant analogy, if you will. But uh, I was trying to relate this back to like real life, and told Stephen this story earlier. But like when I go, when COVID hit, I had nice long hair before and decided to get rid of it all, and then couldn't justify paying to get my head shaved. So now I get my beard done as well, right? So every time I go to the barber, I get my head shaved and beard done, and I tell the guy what I want, and he cuts my hair. And the first time I did it, I had to explain everything. Uh, and then the second time, it got a bit better. And now I go and it's like I get a beer, he chats to me, asks about my family, get my haircut. It's like a really 
nice experience because he knows me, he knows what, he knows what I want, uh, and it's a, it's a nice experience. We literally have the ability to offer that exact experience across every single touch point on digital, and we've messed up so much that it's the equivalent of me going to the barber every time with a cloak on and saying, guess who I am, and trying to figure <laughs> out what I want. And that, that is genuinely what we're doing as an industry. And to me, like, that, I completely agree with your point. Like, it's about trust, and how do we build that trust back? We shouldn't be figuring out mitigations to cookies being blocked. We should figure out, why would a user actively not want a personalized experience? Yeah. That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so I think, to me, that's, that's the most important thing as an industry, and specifically with MarTech, we can really do to, to help and shape the future. Um, yep. you know? Yeah, um, I completely agree with that. It's a very good analogy. I think it also goes back to marketing basics in the sense that we should really try to offer value. At the end of the day, we should always be trying to offer value at every interaction as much as possible. Of course, it's a bit ideal, um, but, but that should be it, right? And I think we'll need to become... Uh, more and more creative in how to offer that value so that we can actually be able to gather more understanding of our customers even as things are becoming harder and harder through regulation and stuff like that. Yeah, brilliant. Just about five seconds left if anyone's got any questions for anyone on the panel. No? All right, look, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you all for staying. Thank you very much. <laughs>